At the edge of the Andes range, a pristine landscape meets the three granite peaks of pain. Spanning across the southern part of Chile, Torres del Paine National Park covers over half a million acres of mountains, lakes, glaciers, and valleys. Black-neck swans and Chilean flamingos dot the numerous lakes in the region. Guanacos, cousins of the llamas of the north, fill the fields. Large Andean condors take to the skies, scavenging for carrion. Rarely seen, and even more rarely filmed, the puma is the top predator of these mountains. The puma survives off the various fauna of the region, ranging from small hares to the large adult guanacos. Revered by the Inca people, the pumas are skilled apex predators. They prey on many of the animals in the park, from the smallest to the largest. These big cats can be found all over the Americas, making their homes in the forests, deserts, jungles and fields from the north to the south. Over the course of two years, Hugh Miles filmed the pumas of Torres del Paine, following one cat in particular. Experiencing both heartbreak and joy, triumph and loss, he gives us the story of the great lion of the Andes. Running along the western coast of South America, the Andes Mountains are the longest mountain range in the world. They culminate at the tip of Chile at the Southern Ocean. These mountains are the home of the puma, one of the big cats of South America. One particular territory is the Torres del Paine National Park. Here, these large felines have wide grassy hills, craggy mountain peaks, and long lakes to stalk. Ruled by the weather, this park is part of Patagonia, an area of South America filled with extremes. Protected in the park, Gifted animal filmographer Hugh Miles is undertaking an extensive stay to film the pumas that live there. Using his experience filming other wild animals, Hugh sets up camp around a lake where there have been multiple pumas spotted. Filming pumas is a daunting prospect. 
but I love these inspiring landscapes and the chance of getting to know such beautiful cats is a real privilege. That Wanako is alarmed, as well it might be. There are two pumas on that far hill. I can only just make them out, but one's bigger than the other. Maybe a mother and large cub, or a male and female. They're looking a bit nervous, but I'll try to get closer. It's always exciting when approaching an animal for the first time, especially something as charismatic as a big cat. Wow, he's not happy. Those flattened ears mean he's terrified. This is gonna be difficult. Hugh readies for a long shoot. He will stay in the area for two years filming the pumas and various other animals of this landscape. A few are more easily won over than others, such as his new neighbors, foxes, who can be tamed with a few treats. After only a couple of weeks, I have this charming little gray fox completely trusting me, and I hope in time I'll win the trust of a wild puma. <coughs> My helper in this quest is an old friend from Argentina, Donaldo McIver. We're a team of just two to limit disturbance. Our search for pumas begins where they've been seen in the past. Lake Sarmiento is huge, like an inland sea, its coast riddled with caves. But pumas are solitary animals with large territories, so there are probably only a few cats along this whole shoreline. A traveling cat will more than likely follow the coast, so I hide with the camera close to the shore while Donnie watches from a distance to warn me if a cat is approaching. Then we wait. And wait. But we're lucky. After only three days, a cat is heading our way. Hello, Hugh, do you copy? Yeah, go ahead. There's one coming around the coast now. It's looking pretty nervous. Should be about three minutes. OK, thanks, Donnie. I'll be careful. It's looking a bit tense. Obviously aware that something odd is hidden in the bushes. Jeez, that's one lovely cat. A female, I think. Six feet of feline grace. That's lucky, she's going into a cave. I'll concentrate on this one spot and see if she gets used to me. Those ears are so expressive. Turned back listening to me. Yes, I'm sure she's a female. She has a thinner face than that male we saw earlier. And this is encouraging. She isn't fleeing. If she sticks around, she might be our star. We soon learn that she'll accept only one person at a time. So Donny looks for other cats while I tried to get her used to me being out in the open. And after several weeks, it's working. Well, sort of. She's wagging her tail in annoyance. I wonder what goes on in her mind. Eye contact is most important to a cat, and I have to look away to release the tension. Luckily, she's beginning to ignore me and my shadow on the rocks. She's more interested in considering whether she could catch those grazing wanakos. Our persistence is beginning to pay off.
Spring is a bountiful time for prey for Penny. Upland geese and the rear are both options for her to feed on. One integral animal is the hare, which are a thriving food source for the puma. While smaller animals are available, the largest size food source available for the puma are the guanacos. Males fiercely battle for breeding rights for two weeks in spring. Guanacos are vigilant against hunting pumas. Penny mostly hunts at night, but stays watchful for any unguarded moments with the guanacos. While most would see an open field as exposed, the guanacos use the clear space to their advantage to see any stalking predators. Births happen quickly, and newborns have an immediate instinct to become nimble on their feet. Chilengos. The young can be an easy target for a puma if they aren't as wary as the adults. Up until now, it's been impossible to film penny hunting. For if she's being watched by anyone, Wanakos or me, she just gives up. But after several weeks of patience, she's trusting me enough to continue, though with one ear keeping track of me. not to catch the attention of any guanacos, lest they alert the rest of the herd and run off.
they will easily relocate to a sheep ranch that borders the park, emboldened by weak fences. The fences also fail to keep out the pumas as they follow the herds. Flocks of sheep provide lots of opportunities for pumas to hunt, and the ranch owners have a growing animosity towards the hunters. It is illegal to hunt pumas in Chile, but the ranch owners disregard the laws to protect their sheep, sometimes offering bounties for the big cats. Dogs are employed to track the pumas that cross into the ranches and often follow even when the puma crosses back into the park. Hugh and Donnie are unable to find Penny after she was chased by the hunter and the dogs, and they begin to fear the worst. They follow the trail and discover how far into the park the hunter went. There are puma tracks along the shore of the lake, edged by horse tracks. They follow the tracks to one of the caves that line the shore and call the park rangers after finding alarming evidence that a puma has been shot. Hugh and Donnie have called Jovito Gonzalez and Juan Toro who protect the animals in the national park. The park rangers find not just one kill site, but two other caves have shells and extensive bloodshed. Penny has disappeared from the lake shore, and Hugh and Donnie continue to search her territory, hoping that she has survived the hunting party. The seasons change, and Penny stays hidden away from Hugh and Donnie. As winter snow begins to pile high, the guanacos begin to migrate away from the lake and Penny's cave. The smaller herds unite into larger groups along the trails that lead west to snow-free feeding grounds. Though we haven't seen Penny since the hunting incident, we've never given up hope that she's still alive. And while searching for her by the cave one day, we find puma tracks and our spirits soar. Are these Penny's prints? That evening, we have the answer. is our beautiful cat, still very much alive. It's great to see her again.
Being with Penny day after day, I've learnt that the late evening, night and early morning are her most important hunting and feeding times. Pumas cover their kills with vegetation or snow to hide food that could last several days. But Penny stays nearby to discourage the condors from scavenging her meal. Pumas tend to eat only at night, whereas foxes are always alert for any opportunity, and these two compete for Penny's buried treasure. They mustn't get too preoccupied. Given half a chance, Penny would eat them too. Fox's speed nearly always saves them, and Penny seems weary. So after a long night's hunting, it's time to return to the den for her daytime sleep. Condors circle Penny's unguarded kill. The bird's heft is suited to the windy weather of the Andes as their 10-foot wingspan helps them soar and glide as they search for food. find Penny sniffing around above her den. She's keenly interested, as if she smells another cat, and maybe it's a male. Pumas become sexually mature between two and three years old, and if Penny is as young as I suspect, this could be her first encounter. Mountain lions can breed in any month, but down here in Patagonia, the pumas tend to have kittens in the spring. Her behavior does suggest a male is around. She seems keen, but hesitant, just like any young lady on a blind date. And there he is, a big male waiting by the den. Penny seems apprehensive. In fact, Rather touchingly, she circles round closer to me than him. Seems extraordinary that she trusts a human more than a puma. I feel quite honored. He's not happy with me. Probably can't understand Penny's relaxed attitude. He doesn't seem to be too impressed by him. He's a powerful looking cat, easily recognized by those more distinct black and white markings on his face. Unlike Penny's rather laid back, provocative attitude, it doesn't look as though the male will relax while I'm here. So as he sits looking at his potential mate, 
I give them privacy and retreat back to camp. I see Penny and the male together just once more, in moonlight near our tents. If they did mate, gestation is about three months, so she might have cubs in the spring. Spring has returned to the area, and with it comes the bountiful wildlife and waterfowl, such as Chilean flamingos and ruddy ducks. Fox kits play in the rugged landscape. Hugh and Donny still have no sign that Penny is around the park. Spring turns to summer, and summer turns to fall, and the animals mark the change and begin to prepare for the harshness that winter brings to the region. The Guanaco herds merge together again, and the fate of Hugh's huntress remains a mystery. At last I find Penny again, and after all this time, her attitude to me seems different. Is it a warning to keep my distance, or a gesture of friendship? Either way, if she does have cubs, I hope she'll lead me to them. If they were born in the spring, they should have been out of the den for several weeks. I follow her into a steep-sided valley, at the bottom of which is a dried-up lake. This bush should break up my silhouette on the skyline. I can just make her out in the marsh, lying on a bed of dried reeds. And she does have a cover. Ah, oh, two more playing nearby. Three in all, a normal sized litter. Must be about four months old. What charming little kittens they are. My joy at finding the cubs is short-lived, for in trying to find a better camera position, she spots me and is terrified, absolutely shaking with fear. Her wild instincts seem to have taken over completely. She's abandoning her cubs. Understandable, I guess. I suppose she thinks I'm a hunter. She's obviously choosing to protect her own life, 
Or is she trying to draw me away from her cubs, as mountain lions have been known to do in North America? Whatever the reason, I pray that her departure is only temporary. It's a tense situation, for filming wild animals, however well-intentioned, often disturbs them and can even put their lives at risk. And the animal's welfare must come first. But I've really blown it this time. I pull back to a safe distance from Penny, and much to my relief, as darkness approaches, she relaxes and seems to accept me again. Then she starts heading back to the cubs. After the scare I gave Penny, I lose her for several days, but eventually find her to the west of her den. She only has two cubs, and I wonder where the third one has gone. Donnie and I just walk and walk, scouring the hills for Penny and her cubs and clues of their presence. And about a week later, we come across one of Penny's old kills. And there, close to it, is a sad sight. The third cub, its body already desiccated by the relentless wind. Its skull is flat on one side. Must have been crushed by another puma, for nothing else is... It's a tearful moment, and we pray that Penny's other cubs will survive. Hugh and Donnie are lucky, as Penny returns to the lakeside and the caves that they know. This location provides Penny with plenty of spaces to hide and stalk her favorite prey. Spooked, but this time by a little puma and one that poses no threat. The guanaco runs off. With this herd alert to their presence, Penny moves on to a different area to hunt. As Penny and the cubs move through the landscape, Hugh and Donnie follow their progression through the park. Penny is finding just how tough it is to raise a family, and driven by hunger, hunts in all weathers. Without surprise on her side, Penny has little chance against a fleet-footed hare, and she needs larger meals too. But the Wanakos have been driven west by the blizzards, and Penny must follow. Hungry or not, the cubs remain playful as they follow her trail. They're eight months old now, and I soon appreciate how effective their large paws are in soft snow. They glide over the surface while I struggle to keep up, drilled into deep drifts by 50 pounds of camera gear. But I'm desperate to see a successful Wanako hunt, and Penny is keen too. On this particular day, she walks six miles. 
but it may be worth it. For every success, there are many failures, and almost inevitably, it seems, Penny is spotted. But she has another problem. Her quest for a meal has taken her deep into the home range of another cat, and it's watching us all from the top of the cliff. This one also has cubs, three large ones. I'm keen to find out who Penny's neighbour is, and though the cubs make themselves scarce and their mother is shy at first, she's remarkably tolerant. Living deep inside the park, perhaps she has little fear of humans. Extremely wary of this stranger, for pumas will defend their litters fiercely. So each family avoids confrontation by putting wild country between them. cubs seem unwilling to do anything but play. And Penny is reluctant to leave the area too, for this is where the Wanakos are holed up for the winter. But she must retreat to ensure her cubs' safety. They'll be hungry again, but spring is on the way. With the thaw comes a food supply, for as winter loosens its icy grip on the land, the Wanakos migrate back to the area where Penny lives. She was obviously lying in ambush, for we discover a fresh-killed Wanako, carefully hidden to await her return with the cubs. At dusk, I walk down to my camera near the carcass, and with Wanakos to warn me of Penny's approach, I'm free to enjoy these glorious skies. With the dawn chorus in full voice, Penny leads the cubs away taking them to different parts of the home range each day to ensure they know the best places to hunt and hide. Their survival is important, for pumas are a vital part of the natural cycle in these mountains. From the sun's power to the growing plants, the plant eaters and their death and decay, all these elements must be balanced if the land is not to be damaged. In turn, pumas themselves are profoundly dependent on the life support systems they help to create. So it's not just sentiment that makes Penny and her cubs important. Pumas, cougars, mountain lions, they must all survive if these wild places are not to lose their essential spirit, their inspiration. But the story is not quite complete. I heard recently that Penny and the cubs are still alive. And though I'll always be disappointed that fate didn't allow me to see her actually catch a Wanaka, maybe that is how it should be. She's kept many secrets.
retain her mystery and dignity. And I have many wonderful memories. For this completely wild puma gave me the privilege of sharing part of her life, even trusting me enough to sleep by my side. Her presence in the mountains is not a shadow. It's a shining light. 